Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our expert webinar session. I am Akash from Spring People. Spring People is India's largest enterprise training provider. In today's session, we have with us Vijay Simha, an IoT expert, who would talk about the opportunities of IoT applications in the post COVID-19 world. He will deliberate the key challenges that professionals need to address while deploying enterprise grade IoT applications and discuss the latest trends in this field. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box and these will be addressed by Vijay after the presentation is over. I would also request you to provide your feedback at the end of the webinar, which will help us in maintaining the quality of our future events. Now, without any further ado, I would hand it over to Vijay. Thank you, Akash, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, my name is Vijay Simha, and uh, I have a startup uh, in the IoT space. Uh, we have been working on developing uh, IoT solutions uh, for uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, as of now and we intend to uh, develop solutions in the manufacturing industries and hopefully in the agricultural space as well uh, i have a total of around 22 years of uh, experience in the industry uh, out of which uh, pretty much the first 17 years i was with uh, a company called saskin communication technologies where i was primarily working on embedded systems communication protocols uh, android systems development and similar uh, work uh, over the past uh, five years, I've been focusing on the IoT space and I've been uh, pretty much uh, involved in developing IoT solutions over the past uh, five years. So uh, when, uh, when we had a discussion with Spring people on what should be the topic of the webinar, uh, I felt the most appropriate thing to do would be to sort of address uh, the opportunities that are likely to uh, emerge uh, once we are uh, over with the current COVID-19 pandemic that we are all facing. Uh, so I said, uh, I said the best approach would be to sort of look forward and then see what is it that can uh, that can be done from a proactive perspective. Uh, so that's that's how the topic came up. Uh, but then as I thought about it, uh, I felt one of the first questions that most people may have is, uh, yeah. It, it's good to think about the opportunities, but will IoT take away our jobs? Uh, that's probably the first question that many people uh, do get. Uh, uh, most of the digital transformation technologies like IoT, AI, uh, blockchain, machine learning, each of these technologies, uh, they, uh, they induce different emotions um, within different people. Uh, for some, it is... Uh, an enthusiastic participation for some it is fear that uh, what will happen to my job uh, so we will address to a certain extent some of these parts although i would like to focus my um, uh, uh, approach towards what iot can actually do so let's move further um, so yeah this is going to be the agenda of the session uh, we'll first look at what uh, iot is one minute let me just go back i think we went a bit further yeah uh, this is the agenda of this session we'll first look at what iot is one of the issues that happens with iot is uh, iot is more of a paradigm it's not one technology it's a uh, it's a coming together of multiple technologies so along with it being a mixture of multiple technologies uh, it is also seen differently by different people uh, so it's also important for us to get into a common understanding of what IoT is. So I'll probably lay the foundation with uh, what 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 I mean by IoT. We'll take a few exemplary use cases, uh, which which would help me communicate uh, uh, the nuances of where and how IoT is useful. Then we'll talk about a typical IoT architecture uh, and then we'll look at a few key challenges and then finally we'll look at what are the opportunities that we'll have going forward. So let me move further. Uh, so what is Internet of Things? Uh, when I say Internet of Things, uh, there are two parts to this phrase. 
one is the internet and the other part is the things and when we say things here we mean uh, any physical thing around us it could be a table it could be a fan it could be a chair it could be a machine it could be a car it could be a bike it could be anything physical thing that is there around us now what do we do with these normal things we essentially embed uh, computing intelligence into these things what does computing intelligence mean uh, it could mean sensors that uh, identify the location of a car it could mean um, a temperature sensor which could measure the temperature in a furnace um, it could be any other sensor that uh, senses the physical parameters around that particular thing um, now one is the sensor part of it second is the uh, typically we will need a microcontroller which will process the sensed data and then send it to the uh, to the internet now what did we do once we uh, embed these things with computing intelligence we connect them to the internet using various communication protocols now typically this is seen as the definition of internet of things where you take things uh, you embed computing intelligence and then connect them to the internet but what is more important is for us to understand why we are actually doing this the whole reason why we are doing this is we are deriving actionable insights from the data we receive from things so that we can respond effectively right so the whole uh, approach is to to make sure that we start with a purpose the whole intent is to <coughs> make sure that we understand what is the actionable insight that we are trying to derive from the data that we get things and that actionable insight should uh, help either a human or an actuator to respond to the situation at hand right and then we work backwards and then say okay if i need to have this actionable insight what should be the data that i need and if this is the data that i need what kind of sensors do i need to incorporate within the thing all right so that's the overall uh, approach that we will take in internet of things let me take uh, a couple of examples and then take it forward uh, you might uh, you might have uh, had a look at your electric meter at your home uh, now what used to happen till now uh, the bescom or the utilities company uh, would have installed electricity meters at your uh, at your homes and till now the approach was uh, every month a person from the uh, utilities company would uh, go to each and every home note down the uh, reading meter reading and then he would take it back to his office and probably type it in into his computer and of course over the past couple of years we now have uh, those uh, smart devices that he can uh, punch in locally and then generate a bill but uh, he still needs to go to each and every house now how does a smart electric meter help what you see on your screen is a smart electric meter where uh, this meter also apart from being able to measure the um, consumption uh, it also is able to directly send the uh, uh, measured uh, data to the utilities company directly now this obviates the need for a person to visit each and every home now uh, one is the fact that the utilities company would um, have significant uh, cost savings in terms of uh, the effort and the cost involved in sending uh, a person to each and every house apart from this there are significant other advantages as well um, uh, as far as the consumer is concerned he has a understanding of his daily consumption uh, one of the issues that happens with people is that if you are getting information at the end of the month you hardly have any room to uh, um, uh, modulate your consumption uh, but if i'm getting a um, uh, indication as to okay this is how much i consumed yesterday i can actually figure out okay what should i do today how should i uh, conserve uh, the energy uh, so the fact that you have data uh, usually drives people to take uh, better action right uh, second 
as far as the utilities uh, companies concerned, uh, they have a better understanding of the demand uh, based on uh, the time of the day, based on the geographic location. They can predict demand much better and hence their efficiencies improve as well. So uh, from that perspective, uh, smart electric meter is seen as one of the uh, almost uh, for sure uh, I think IoT things that will actually come into uh, being in the next few years. Uh, yeah, it may take uh, more time for uh, for the deployments to happen, primarily because we are working on certain communication protocols that are uh, more suitable for this. But uh, I expect in the next few years, uh, smart electric meters will be will be pretty much common. Uh, now, if this is the case, um, what would be the uh, typical IoT architecture for such kind of a uh, use case. Uh, now I'm trying to generalize the IoT architecture here. Uh, so in almost all IoT architectures, although there is no one standard architecture, uh, we usually start with this and then customize it for each and every use case. Uh, typically on the left hand side, you will have an H tier, uh, which essentially has all of our things that I mentioned. Uh, it will it, it it may have, uh, uh, for example, in the figure, you can actually see certain uh, vehicles, you can see healthcare related data, you can see factory related data. Now, each of these uh, 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 terminal nodes, we call them as ter terminal nodes. Each of these terminal nodes sends the data from the environment and then it sends the data to the platform tier, which would typically be our cloud. And uh, that communication may happen through a, an intermediate gateway which we call as the edge gateway or it could happen directly right uh, so once this data reaches the platform tier uh, we do data transformation we may do analytics we may do operations in terms of device management and other things and then the uh, the information is ready to be consumed uh, by applications on the right hand side which is the enterprise tier right where you may have domain specific applications you may have uh, people with their mobile phones or you may have uh, a person for example in the utilities company who uh, accesses it through his web page right so it's essentially the ui part of it so you have on the left hand side a terminal node on the center you have the cloud and then you have the front end ui applications so these are the typically the three parts now we may have situations where based on the use case we may move certain uh, operations and functionalities to the edge side we may move uh, certain operations to the right side so based on the use case we tweak around with this uh, broad architecture but in general this is the typical iot architecture one of the other ways to see this is uh, on the left hand side you are doing a sensing uh, in the middle you are doing the analysis and on the right hand side you are actually doing the uh, responding aspect now the response can happen uh, through a human uh, or it could be a actuator um, similarly in the cloud in most situations the analysis is is done by a data analytics module in ai ml or dl kind of a module or it could be uh, an approach where we say okay i will just present the data and then visualize it but i'll allow the human to sort of uh, derive the final analysis so uh, uh, we usually tweak around with this broad architecture, but this would uh, probably give you the uh, starting point as far as an IoT architecture is concerned. Now, let me go to the next question, which is uh, which is what many of us have, uh, which is, will IoT take away our jobs? Now, if I go back to your uh, smart electric meter uh, use case, most of you would come back to me and then say yeah we are we are essentially having a situation where the person who would come to our homes would uh, would essentially lose his job um, but then yes he may lose his job but is that all uh, is there more to this is the question so let me take an uh, example or a use case uh, which is something that i uh, relate to personally uh, and this is a use case from the sports perspective uh, it's a it's a tennis racket. Uh, this is a smart tennis racket made by a company called Babolat. Babolat has been making uh, uh, rackets over the past 60, 70 years. And uh, recently they have come up with a smart tennis racket. 
Now, the reason why I like this use case is uh, because I can relate to it personally. Around 10 years back, um, I was a typical IT industry guy. And uh, so well, most of us go through these uh, fads where you want to become fit and all those kind of things. So I said, okay, let me join uh, a tennis academy. Let me let me become fit and all those kind of things. So I went and joined a tennis academy. Um, there I was assigned a coach, tennis coach by name Suresh. And uh, what he would do was uh, he would uh, get a ball boy uh, to uh, you know, feed uh, tennis balls to me and I was supposed to practice my swing, my uh, serves and all those kinds. This went on for three months. I got really bugged uh, and by three months I, I sort of gave up. I said this is not fun anymore. I don't want to uh, spend all my time just practicing my swing, my serves and all those kind of things. He would actually stand in a corner and he would keep on telling me Vijay your swing is not fine. Your racket is not reaching the back of your um, spine. Uh, the You're not hitting the ball in the center. Uh, I would get irritated uh, because this guy would be on his phone and uh, once in a while he would lift his head up and then he would make a comment and then go back to his phone. Uh, obviously that was irritating to me and on top of that uh, I thought I would play some games and this guy was just making me uh, play uh, 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 just do practice right uh, on top of that it was quite expensive he used to charge me I think uh, 2500 if I'm right 2500 or 3000 rupees per month and I felt that was quite expensive and his response uh, was uh, uh, Vijay I have to spend the entire 45 minutes for you and at best I get Three or four people like you per uh, for for minus one and if i have to do this for an entire month i'm going to depend on three or four people like you because i'm exclusively spending 45 minutes for each of you and uh, that makes it quite expensive now what does the smart tennis racket do uh, i think the slide is uh, loading uh, yes, I think all of you now have the new slide. So this is a uh, a smart tennis racket which has multiple sensors uh, which can uh, give data hard objective data on uh, what kind of shots you are hitting when are you doing a top spin? What is the, what's your serve speed? What is the swing that you are getting? How many times are you doing forehand? How many times backhand? Uh, is your smash going fine? Right? What kind of power are you generating? Uh, what's your ball serve speed? Where is the impact? All these kind of things, right? So it it provides all this data um, on your phone. In addition, uh, this is available on the net, so you can actually post all this data to your um, Facebook profiles your Instagram and all those kind of things so you you can actually put it onto your social media this this information is available to be shared with your friends you may have a um, uh, you may have a coaching buddy who's in another city and you may sort of exchange your stats so the entire works you have uh, a lot of data that is being generated based on how you're playing your game and that data is uh, shared with you uh, on your phone as well as uh, it is there on the internet so you can take a call on whether you want to share it with others or not right now uh, I have a question for you guys uh, if you were a tennis coach would you recommend babble at play to your trainees now that's a Tricky question, right? If, if you are a tennis coach, would you recommend Babel at play to your trainees? One of the first things that uh, a person like Suresh may say is that, yeah, first of all, I was getting three or four people. Uh, now, uh, if you if you have an app and a racket that can do whatever I was doing, then it will take away even those three or four people, right? Why would I want to sort of replace myself as a coach, right? So that could be one approach. Uh, let us see if there are uh, a better uh, way of looking at the entire thing. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm visualizing a situation uh, on the left hand side with uh, a traditional coaching kind of an approach and on the right hand side uh, with 
how things change when you have a tennis coach and a trainee who is using a babble at play and uh, on the left hand side you see four uh, four different uh, personas or stakeholders uh, one is the tennis coach in in this case it is suresh trainee uh, in this case it's me you have the tennis federation and then you have the company which is manufacturing the uh, racket which is babble at um, so how does uh, each uh, of these uh, people uh, get impacted with the uh, smart tennis racket right uh, one of the first things that uh, happens uh, with these kind of uh, engagements where you need one on one coaching is that uh, in fact this is what suresh told me suresh said i am spending the entire 45 minutes with you and i have to charge you those 45 minutes so in this case either i as a trainee am paying through my nose uh, or if i don't pay much then he is hardly getting anything so he doesn't have a choice but to charge a higher per person fee right and that effectively means that he needs to coach primarily rich people but rich people don't want to run around right so he has a chicken and egg kind of a situation where uh, he he needs rich people to coach who he can charge high but the rich people rich kids don't want to sort of play tennis they want to play much simpler games right uh, how does this change with uh, babble at play now one approach is to say that yeah i'll i'm being replaced by the uh, uh, by the uh, smart racket and the app the other appro approach is to sort of say that uh, here yeah, now i don't need to sort of spend those 45 minutes exclusively with you you go play your game uh, i will have uh, um, a ball boy feed the balls to you or probably i'll have a machine that will actually feed the balls to you uh, you can you can sort of play and probably once in three days or once in twice in a week thrice in a week i will sit with you we will go through the data and then we will say okay how you are doing what kind of uh, what percentage of your serves are going fine? Is there a functional uh, issue with the way you're keeping your uh, feet? I can I can sort of have a situation where the coach spends quality 10-15 minutes with each people each of the uh, trainees and Thereby he can have a batch size of let's say 20 people 25 people, right? That way he can have a lower cost per person right and that is a significant shift right he can now address a larger market the middle class gets included now you can have a larger number of people who can afford uh, tennis training uh, he can probably go and partner with schools and corporates where he can probably uh, help uh, the uh, the uh, physical education instructor in the schools uh, with uh, additional support based on the data that he gets from the uh, from the app he can tie up with corporates he can he can pretty much make a career out of this primarily because it increases the number of students that he can address right uh, one of the other um, aspects that uh, Suresh used to sort of uh, tell me personally is that he gets bugged uh, having to watch people struggle with their initial serves initial uh, swings and all those kind of things for 45 minutes. I mean, that's pretty boring job. Who would want to uh, keep watching a person struggle with his initial uh, uh, initial uh, times during the learning period, right? It's a painful thing. I mean, why would you want to spend 45 minutes do, do, doing that? But now, uh, with 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 this data coming, he doesn't have to stand there for 45 minutes. He can spend quality time of let's say five minutes, ten minutes with each of the persons, and then he can move to a higher order of thinking. He can actually start thinking, okay, why is this guy uh, 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 having this kind of an issue, right? Is there a way in which I can um, give better suggestions to solve his problem? He can move to a higher order thinking using the data that he is actually getting right now this is from a coach's perspective what does it mean for me as a trainee first in the traditional approach the typical thing is that okay tennis is very expensive this is for princes and i can't afford it right but now i can afford it right i can have uh, uh, an approach where i say that okay yeah 
the cost is being distributed amongst multiple people and the more number of uh, trainees the coach has uh, he has the possibility of reducing the fees and I have the possibility of affording it uh, uh, better right uh, second issue as I said was that the coach used to keep on nagging me with subjective data what is the issue there the issue there was the fact that it is subjective data the fact that it is his perspective versus my perspective his perspective was that I was not um, uh, having the swing right I felt that I was having the swing uh, swing right right uh, but now how does uh, it change now I have objective data now, right I don't have the I don't have to rely on what the coach says the coach doesn't have to worry about convincing me we both have objective data and we can say okay this is what the data says right there's no questions asked right? it's 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 simple and straightforward uh, the other aspect was for me practice was boring right I didn't want to just keep on practicing but now I can once you start having uh, a measurement of data then you start having challenges I can say okay today I was uh, serving at let's say 90 kilometers per hour tomorrow I want to do it at 100 kilometers per hour I can have my own challenges on top of that the moment it goes onto social media uh, the motivation levels are significantly different right so the the availability of data changes the entire perspective of of what I can actually do with that so what was a uh, boring practice session could actually translate towards a daily set of challenges and a daily set of uh, ongoing uh, communication that I can have with my friends right um, I can also use this to find a uh, doubles partner uh, who has a better surf right uh, I'm, I'm let's say uh, a player who uh, primarily plays on the uh, uh, on the uh, a boundary line and let's say I want a person who has a better surf I can use uh, the app to find out some other person in some other part of the world who has a better surf right that is that is a significant advantage that I as a uh, trainee has provided yeah I reach the levels where I need uh, a doubles partner who is good enough uh, the other thing that I, I may want at a later level is that let's say I want Agassi to coach me right but uh, why would Agassi uh, agree to sort of coach me right uh, <laughs> uh, I can I can share my data and if I'm if I'm good enough I can I can probably uh, get him to sort of agree right now this is a significant shift that just one tennis racket is giving me now how does this change for the tennis federation right uh, one of the issues that used to happen for uh, tennis it used to happen with uh, cricket as well is that uh, the most of the uh, administrators are in the metros and unless they go to each and every tier two towns they don't uh, get the uh, talent from uh, all parts of the country they are they their primary focus area are the clubs that are there in the metros right and in metros you essentially have the rich spoiled brats so many of them are not willing to put the kind of effort that is actually needed so there, there is a typical frustration that uh, that actually comes in right uh, in in the Babel at play case where the data of each and every player from each and every tier two tier three towns is available at the uh, at the click of a finger uh, you now have a way for the tennis federation to uh, have a talent search team let's say in a centralized play like Bangalore place like Bangalore and then they can scout for uh, uh, candidates from various tier 2, 3 or tier rounds who have uh, the, the the kind of uh, aptitude and the uh, capabilities once they identify them they can get them to let's say the sports authority of India and give, give them better training right so uh, ability to search for candidates across uh, the country uh, becomes significantly better in fact this is this is what is called uh, the flattening of opportunities right you're 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 able to give opportunities to um, um, to many people uh, across uh, across the country and across the world irrespective of their geographical locations right now that's with the tennis federation uh, the obvious thing would be how would it help uh, a company like Babolat right uh, uh, one of the biggest issues for Babolat would be to uh, figure out what their pricing should be right uh, if the price is too low then their profitability is low 
if the price is too high then the number of people who can afford their racket will be low and hence their overall revenues will be low right so it's 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 always a problem right how can that get addressed here one of the ways to address that issue uh, issue is to have uh, personalized rackets right um, uh, i will give a standard racket initially for everyone which could be an affordable racket right and then once the data comes uh, comes to me over the next one or two months i will analyze the data and then i will go back to the player and then say uh, you seem to be a player who uh, relies on yourself let me give you a racket that can sort of help you better with the serve let me change the uh, frame probably increase the size of the frame reduce the weight of the racket whatever it is but the intent here is to personalize and once you personalize you you have the opportunity to get higher margins you can because you are providing this as a service uh, an additional service you have the ability to position the racket as a uh, as a personalized service and then you can probably charge uh, people who can uh, who can pay more right uh, in a uh, in a different manner uh, to those people who you cannot uh, charge higher right so that would increase the wider uh, that would increase the customer base as well as increase your margins right you have additional monetization of the data as i say data is a new oil now uh, you have lots of data that you are actually getting from your users this data you can actually use for uh, um, for advertisements for monetization you can share this data with uh, uh, let's say uh, shoe manufacturers you can help them personalize uh, their products right of course uh, you have the issue of privacy and all those kind of things coming in but yeah once we resolve all those aspects uh, there is a possibility of uh, higher monetization uh, for uh, babylon and that is a significant opportunity for for any company right uh, the other issue that uh, most companies would have had uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the rackets they don't once the date once the racket reaches the field they don't know uh, uh, what happens after two years right you you don't know whether the rackets are holding up have they start have they started to sort of have the string started to loosen up you don't know right with the new approach you have data coming in so you can you can see after two years okay this is a racket that is that has spent two years in the field what's the data should i change the material should i not change the material should the string quality be improved so that way you can have uh multiple uh, participants derive significant benefits out of this right uh, so one smart tennis racket we can pretty much change the dynamics of an industry right that's what i mean now with this you have a tennis coach having a job which he was dog full of earlier you have more number of trainees you have the tennis uh, federation coming in you have the company uh, uh, sort of uh, monetizing better you pretty much have a win win situation here right uh, so it's a similar situation with uh, with another example that you would have uh, uh, been very familiar with uber and ola and you have seen the impact of that right uh, the uh, the willingness of uh, a middle class or a lower middle, uh, middle class person to take a taxi earlier was very very low now you have a lot of people opting for taxis why because the cost of um, uh, hiring a taxi has reduced why because the efficiencies has uh, has uh, has grown and you have more drivers being employed as compared to earlier and many of the drivers feel that they are earning much higher as well right um, so uh, uber and ola is nothing but a smart car uh, which which essentially is able to uh, communicate what its location is what its our uh, uh, availability is and on the other side of uh, the platform you have users who are essentially needed uh, let's move on to another example in my opinion the biggest value adder that uh, iot can uh, can sort of uh, bring in in terms of value uh, is industrial iot uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, improvements of efficiencies is possible uh, in industries you can have various sensors in various machines you can have uh, iot for improving processes tools remote operations right uh, it's it's an entire world altogether uh, it's typically called the industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution some people call it digital transformation but it's essentially about using uh, sensor data from each of the uh, uh, things that are there in the machines right 
to analyze and improve the efficiencies within within manufacturing right uh, now let me move further to the next aspects in terms of how do we see the industry changing right uh, now these are a few uh, predictions that uh, we have been talking about uh, over the past few years uh, I mean multiple uh, consultancy entities have been uh, predicting various uh, numbers some people say 50 billion device connected devices some people say 7.1 trillion is the IOT solutions revenue these are pretty huge numbers right but if you notice I've uh, I'm not uh, talking about when these numbers will be uh, reached uh, in fact many of these uh, numbers were predicted around four or five years back and we have not reached a large number of those uh, numbers um, we'll talk about why we have not reached these numbers yet and why I feel that it's likely to change in the near future but one thing that I would want each of you to notice and understand is that the only way these big numbers will be achieved is when the cost in terms of the unit cost of each of these devices go down unless the cost of the of the iot service goes down unless let's say i say the normal tennis racket cost thousand uh, thousand rupees and a uh, smart uh, tennis racket will cost thousand five hundred or thousand eight hundred rupees you're likely to buy right of course things have changed now i think rackets now cost five thousand six thousand rupees but if i say the tennis racket normal tennis racket is thousand rupees and the smart tennis racket is fifteen thousand rupees you'll, you'll, you'll just uh, you'll just say i'm not interested right now right one of the most important things and this is probably one of the reasons why uh, we haven't seen the kind of adoptions uh, that we should have seen is the fact that the cost has not yet reduced but uh, what we are seeing uh, in the industry is that the cost is drastically reducing we currently have uh, uh, in fact BLE chips with uh, uh, microprocessors a cortex m3 cortex m4 microprocessor available at less than a dollar right and we are seeing um, a, a, a reduction in the cost of the input components which should help in reducing the numbers so one of the key things that we need to understand is the is the is the primary challenge that we will have in iot which is about uh, having a large scale uh, at uh, at a at a lower cost right uh, we will talk about this a little bit uh, further down uh, as well during this session but one of the first things that uh, many people ask me uh, over the past few years uh, is uh, isn't this old wine in new bottle i mean taking sensor data and then sending it to a server uh, i've been doing this for quite a few number of years especially people who have been in the embedded system space uh, would uh, would be familiar with this i mean they would have called it telematics they would have called this m to m machine to machine uh, remote monitoring telemetry right these things we have been doing it for the past 15 20 years i mean what's new right uh, the the key thing is to understand uh, what what is it that it is uh, uh, what what's new in the new thing in new approach for iot right uh, the some of the new words that we are or new phrases that we are using is uh, internet of things internet of everything cyber physical systems connected things smart things web of things industry 4.0 they're all uh, the concepts are very similar here different people use different uh, uh, phrases that would suit their uh, marketing needs but essentially we are actually seeing a shift there right so one thing that i would want to address uh, is uh, is uh, how does a person who has been working on this for for a while now um, reorient himself right what is what's different right one of the first few things that that you need to sort of uh, understand is that uh, the scale of what we are actually looking at is significantly different right when you're talking about telematics when you're talking about m2m you're talking about let's say five machines being connected to each other 10 machines connected to each other right the scale is significantly low it is almost like yeah i'm i'm, I'm having a local area network of a few pcs right so instead of pcs i'm going to have my things right so that was the kind of scale that we used to have earlier in terms of telemetry but now with iot you're talking about millions of devices right you're talking about devices that um, that that run into millions but one of the issues that many startups and many companies face is that for example let's take uh, Pablat itself 
when it introduces the racket uh, they'll probably sell a few hundred rackets right but then if it catches on then you're you're selling millions of rackets right and your architecture or your cloud architecture needs to be able to handle both uh, uh, both sides of the spectrum in the sense that it needs to be able to handle 100 devices and yet provide uh, the racket at a relatively uh, low cost otherwise the uh, the adoption will not be there not many people will buy right but once a lot of people buy you show your architecture should still be scalable right your your cloud architecture should still be scalable so one of the biggest issues that you'll have in iot is about handling uh, the variability in scale right you start with a few hundred devices and then you go into millions suddenly right uh, uh, the other aspect is about lower cost which i've been talking about when i say lower cost it is the entire cost cost of the device cost of the cloud computing cost of the uh, uh, manual effort that is involved in commissioning decommissioning the device management related issues if you have a million devices you don't want each uh, tennis uh, racket buyer to call you up and then ask you for uh, uh, for registration and all those kind of things it should be pretty much auto configured you don't want any overheads in terms of manual effort right so all these things will come into cost and you need to make sure that you provide that at less cost another key difference that will actually come is in the aspect of the internet coming in the middle when we were talking about m to m telematics and all those kind of things in many cases yes there are there were cases where you would actually route it through the internet but internet was so much was not so much of a uh, central piece there it was more of an uh, route that we used to have especially if you had things like plc scada systems and all those kind of things they were typically lan kind of an approach uh, whereas when you are moving towards an iot kind of a thing you are actually leveraging the internet that you that you have right and uh, the last uh, uh, aspect that i would want to talk about is a systems approach typically you will not talk about one iot device you will talk about multiple iot device uh, working in conjunction with each other you you would want to have a tennis racket uh, working in conjunction with a uh, smart court right and probably a smart shoes or your wristbands all these will will talk to each other in a systems approach typically in an in an industry as well you will have a situation where multiple um, uh, multiple devices will uh, will talk to each other as well as they'll talk to the internet so this requires a systems approach where we are looking at a holistic system rather than one device independently right now these are the few things that i feel are significantly different when it comes to what we were looking at as telematics telemetry m2m and the new world of iot so uh, these are the uh, in in my opinion the fundamental challenges that anyone in the iot space needs to uh, address these are the fundamental aspects and these aspects are not easy to address let me tell you uh, handling scale architecting your your entire system to be able to uh, handle scale from a few hundred devices to a few hundred millions requires you to uh, architect your system really well right uh, if you have to reduce cost then you'll have to look at each and every component and do it appropriately and that is where the challenge uh, in iot is now let me move to uh, the next aspect of uh, what happens uh, in the next month or two whenever as soon as we are uh, hopefully out of the uh, covid 19 pandemic i mean probably in my opinion this is probably the biggest uh, black swan event uh, i'm not too sure how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, what uh, taleb talks about as a black swan event right uh, it's a it's a it's usually used to used to refer to an event which is unpredictable none of us were able to predict this right and it has a very severe consequence right none of us were able to predict it and we don't even know what it what it will sort of uh, lead to right uh, all, almost all of us can have our own thinking hats and then say okay this is what it will lead to right and none of us know how uh, how long this will take what is going to the be, be the impact right so it would be extremely hard to um, uh, guess what is likely to happen but i think there are certain trends that are uh, very clear right one is the shift towards remote working 
uh, whether it is uh, remote factory workers probably the number of factory workers will reduce many of the supervisors may be in a position they where they would want to sort of monitor it uh, from their homes they may, there may be a situation where you may have multiple shifts right uh, but effectively we are all moving towards uh, uh, remote working right there is a significantly higher focus on operational efficiencies uh, the the almost every company um, or in every industry every e-commerce platform is looking at how to reduce uh, the uh, the operational cost right uh, there is a significantly higher sensitivity towards uh, risk from a human perspective uh, both from a healthcare perspective as well as occupational hazards kind of a perspective uh, for example miners um, people who work in very challenging environments right and the approach is likely to be uh, towards providing them with uh, with a better infrastructure so that the risk of uh, 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 accidents is significantly reduced right um, the other aspect is uh, over the past four or five years i've been talking to multiple industries one of the biggest issues that we faced was that there is an inertia that is naturally there with every industry right they don't uh, want to change especially because when they are when they are busy in production they can't afford a change in their processes right almost every iot internet intervention will change their processes right but now you have a situation where almost all industries have pretty much paused right and hence there is a higher willingness to change going forward right uh, so this leads to a situation where uh, i feel there is a much much higher opportunity for io to make uh, iot to make an impact in the near uh, future i feel uh, we are now at a point where uh, we are at the um, at the start of an deployment uh, uh, up curve right going forward so I will now move on to the last slide that I have, which is more about uh, what kind of uh, opportunities uh, do we all see in the IoT space, right? I will again refer back to the architecture slide that I had actually put in. This is a smaller version of the same diagram, uh, and I will by and large try to sort of divide it uh, based on, on 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 this broad architecture, right? Uh, if you look at it from the left hand side, uh, left hand side, uh, which is the terminal node. Uh, development uh, when I say terminal node this is typically the uh, hardware that you would actually incorporate incorporate within the thing right there's the electronics that you would actually put inside let's say the tennis racket right so obviously you need semiconductors you need electronics hardware design you need embedded systems to sort of uh, write code on that firmware development uh, nowadays you have the uh, emergence of edge analytics that is actually coming in uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, communication protocols that we would need to use for effectively communicating the data that is coming from the sensors. Uh, a huge amount of focus will be on battery and power optimization because uh, unless, unlike a smartphone, which people are comfortable uh, charging on a daily basis, you don't want to be charging your uh, IoT devices on a uh, on a daily basis. The typical expectation for an IoT device is to be able to run on a battery for let's say uh, one or two years, uh, if not more. Right now, if you have to reach that kind of uh, power optimization, there's a huge amount of work that you need to do in terms of battery and power optimization. Right, uh, there is a significant amount of uh, work that is happening on sensors, instrumentation and uh, especially the the uh, the advances that we are seeing over the past few years in the sensor space is, is mind boggling right so there's a huge amount of uh, impact that the latest sensors are making in the iot world uh, mechatronics uh, obviously it's again a combination of mechanical aspects as well as the electronics part that is a significant uh, change uh, so that's as far as the edge tier is concerned uh, in the platform tier, a large amount of work on the cloud computing part, the IoT PaaS platforms, platforms uh, which are uh, which provide uh, various uh, IoT specific functionalities on the cloud. You have a lot of these functionalities that are available now. Let's say like AWS IoT, Azure IoT. These are the ones that can help you scale. I was talking about scale earlier. Uh, these are the kind of platforms that will help in you architecting and um, a, a a design that can actually scale from uh, the lowest numbers to uh, 
uh, the the largest uh, number of uh, devices that you should be able to handle uh, there's a lot of work for database and data store guys so the kind of data that you get from iot is different from what you would have actually got uh, from your typical erp kind of uh, applications so this would require a different approach by the database guys big data distributed computing a typical windmill uh, uh, if i understand right generates around four to five gbs of data per every day now if you have to crunch that kind of data you will need to have distributed computing uh, and and big data tools to, for you to be able to handle that there's a lot of back-end web technologies that can actually come in here uh, you have a lot of ai machine learning deep learning all these kind of things which essentially are used for the analysis part of iot right you have you've done the sensing on the terminal node and on the on the cloud side you probably do the analysis part right um, uh, Sometime down the line, I expect blockchain also to be used in conjunction with IoT and ML AI as well, right? Um, on the enterprise side, uh, if I look at it, uh, mobile application development because it becomes important. What kind of a user interface you are giving to uh, to the user on a smartphone? Web technologies, the front end technologies in case you are providing a web front end, the UI UX related aspects, right? uh the user interface the user experience how do you want to sort of uh, think about it visualization dashboarding right uh, these are very important aspects in helping people reach the right uh, actionable insight visualization and dashboarding are probably the most important tools for people to achieve the right uh, actionable insight uh, you would also need a lot of domain specialists who would probably help you to understand uh, what kind of systems are required in their specific domain whether it's agriculture whether it is industry whether it is healthcare you need a lot of domain specialists who can actually translate their domain specific details to uh, what you can actually do from a um, uh, technology perspective right product design becomes uh, very important there and uh, one of the uh, most important things is uh, almost uh, a large number of people who are who are in the IT space can relate to at least one of these areas, right? And that's where uh, I wanted to sort of put up this slide. Uh, each person who comes from different uh, uh, different domains uh, has an opportunity to play in the IoT space. Uh, one thing that becomes important is for him to understand the key challenges across the uh, across all the three layers, at, at least at a fundamental level. Uh, so that he is able to appreciate the challenges that happens in the other areas. But once he is able to understand and appreciate the overall architecture, his role will be to sort of dig deep in his domain, right? Uh, the important aspect is to be able to do both, to be able to sort of appreciate the challenges that the entire solutioning brings in, as well as digging deeper into uh, specific uh, areas uh, of, of your expertise as well. Uh, you would also need product management, project management, and business analysis skills. But at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is, uh, I mean, uh, IoT, we've been, uh, you'd have heard about IoT at least over the past four or five years, right? I've had situations where um, um, uh, high school children have been doing IoT projects. Uh, there are a lot of courses where uh, you do an IoT project in, let's say, two days, right? What's the key difference between that and uh, what you are likely to do going forward. The key difference is in being able to address the scalability, reliability, the the uh, 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 the borderline cases that you actually see in the real world, right? All those kind of things need to be addressed. And for that to be addressed, you need to be able to address all these areas that uh, that come in, right? And that's that's probably where uh, you would uh, you would uh, need to sort of uh, uh, spend time and effort in terms of being able to understand IoT as a space in a broad manner, uh, and uh, probably pick a few areas amongst these, and then say, okay, these are the areas where I'll dig deeper, right? And I'll probably specialize. Except for a few people in the architects and the senior management layers, uh, who would probably span across all these layers. I would expect most uh, uh, most engineers, senior engineers, to sort of um, dig into each of these areas uh, as a from a vertical depth perspective, uh, but have an understanding of what challenges IoT brings in as an overall uh, uh, overall domain. So uh, I think the key aspect here is about uh, all of us making that shift 
from yeah i made a hobby project in two days or three days to uh, to move to a point where okay how do i make the entire solution reliable how do i make it enterprise grade right and that's probably the challenge that we have uh, in front of us i believe there's a lot of scope for iot in the given uh, uh, in, in the near future and it's more about how all of us prepare for it uh, uh, given this context uh, spring people have uh, uh, have a surprise for you guys uh, so i'll hand it over to satyakshi uh, for uh, for revealing that surprise uh, satyakshi are you there yeah, yeah, I'm there. Hi, everyone. Satyakshi here. Thank you, Vijay, for your valuable insights on IoT. Guys, I hope you all have benefited from this amazing knowledge session. If you all are interested to learn more about IoT, then do check out our virtual in instructor led trainer courses, which will help you to develop real world IoT applications and solutions. and just see at an exclusive price of 14995 only for more details and information do write to us at training at the rate springpeople.com or call on our number which has been displayed in the current slide um, before handing over to vijay for question and answer session i request you to give your valuable feedback which help us to maintain the quality of our future sessions now i hand over to vijay for the question and answer session uh, okay uh, akash uh, okay i see the first question coming in uh, uh, by Abhijit, uh, from the perspective of an opportunity to the middle class uh, to learn uh, tennis, uh, is a smart racket priced effectively to make uh, realize the overall cost saving included in the maintenance? Yes, that's the key thing that we are trying to address, Abhijit. You are you are bang on. Uh, the whole uh, challenge that we have in the IoT industry is not it's not just about making a smart racket right uh, it's not about making we've, we've been having the technology if not in uh, uh, in all companies i'm sure uh, in places like uh, nasa and all the defense labs there have been significant uh, uh, sort of research done earlier over the past 20 30 years in terms of making products that are that can be classified as iot projects but each of those things were uh, extremely expensive right the key thing that we need to do now is uh, not only do we need to make the devices but we need to make the devices at low cost right and that's the challenge um, as sen uh, i have another question now uh, by pramod uh, as sensors are fitted in the racket what if due to impact of ball hits or due to the racket falling down if it records faulty data in this case does it ensure a proper stats reaches the coach Yes, that's a good question, and that's exactly the reason why uh, there's a huge difference between a hobby project of having a, a, a tennis racket and a prototype, and a industry-grade um, smart tennis racket to be prepared. It typically takes two or three years to do that. You will sort of uh, create a, a, a reference racket, then you will sort of give it for people to. Uh, play with it then you will understand what kind of data is coming from it you will you will look at the uh, form factor related aspects you you want to make sure that there is no change in the balance of the racket weight of the racket uh, you want to make sure that it is rugged enough right all these things takes a lot of testing a lot of reliability engineering right uh, and this is where the, the work goes going forward uh, there's a question by abhijit again uh, I, I think this is the same Abhijit. Uh, wasn't the pain point that IoT was chasing to address was more to do with collect data in real time and give it to people instantly for actionable insights? Yes, that is that is true. How has COVID-19 influenced that pain point to make new opportunities emerge? Isn't it that IoT would have still kept going the way it was uh, roadmap irrespective of COVID-19? Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, there are two aspects to it. Uh, uh, there are different parts of IoT that gets uh, 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 that gets uh, 
popular uh, in the world now something like a tennis racket may not have much of a uh, uptick post covid 19 but i believe uh, industrial iot will have a significant uh, number of uh, new takers uh, going forward there's a huge amount of operational efficiency that we can actually bring in when it comes to industrial iot when it comes to healthcare when it comes to agriculture now these are the areas that are uh, crucial to us and these are the areas that will actually uh, impact uh, almost every one of us right and introduction of iot there will increase the operational efficiency which will increase the uh, adoption which will decrease the cost of the individual chips that are there and once the cost of the components decrease then it will enable uh, uh, things like the tennis racket and all those kind of things which typically start with lower numbers to be more viable right so uh, which is also one of the reasons why i believe retail iot may take some more time to come i mean it may take more time for you to buy a smart bulb or a smart uh, fan and all those kind of things because uh, i may not be wanting to sort of invest in a 4000 rupee bulb i might as well sort of get up and switch the uh, and use the switch myself right uh, but uh, the once the difference between a normal bulb and a smart bulb is reduced to let's say 100 rupees or 200 rupees then it will take off for, but for that to happen your iot adoption needs to increase the cost of the chipsets need to reduce and for that uh, I believe places like industrial IoT is what uh, uh, what will drive. I hope that answers your question. Uh, related to the uh, real time, yes, the real time related aspects also come in. There are certain use cases where you need real time. There are certain use cases where real time is not so much of a uh, requirement. Uh, so that's where the architecting aspect of IoT is, is is something that is very important. Almost every use case of IoT needs to be architected differently. You need to be able to choose different uh, communication modules, protocols. You may need to use different chips. You may need to use different sensors, uh, different cloud architectures. For each and every use case, you will need to adapt, uh, and that's that's the uh, that's the thrill of uh, being in the IoT space. Question by Prema: uh, Does robotic system fall into IoT? Yes, there is a significant overlap of robotic systems in the IoT space. Uh, uh, you, uh, in fact, it. it pretty much works uh, hand in hand but one of the issues that you need to understand with robotics is that the latency requirements will be uh, significantly more stringent in which case a, a, a significant amount of analysis you may want to do it on the terminal node itself that is where edge analytics and all those kind of things will come into play uh, especially in those robotic systems where there is significant amount of analytics that are there but there are some uh, uh, robotic systems where it is just pure uh, uh, sensing and actuation without too much of analysis in those cases uh, there will be a direct connection between the sensing and the uh, and the actuators and the data that comes from that is sent to the cloud right so uh, typically in those cases you will have uh, 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 the IOT aspects used more from a uh, 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 from a perspective of understanding the overall aggregated data over a longer time horizon rather than for immediate uh, actions a question by Manoj uh, is a smartphone uh, an IOT device that's a very good question Manoj uh, there's a <coughs> I mean I I have this discussion with multiple people one of the key uh, differentiators that I make between IoT and uh, uh, and a non IoT is uh, is it a thing and uh, is it is it uh, focused on a specific aspect uh, when it comes to a smartphone it is pretty much a general computing device nowadays right you you can argue that it is a phone but it is uh, phone is just one part of the device right so just like a desktop computer it is it is a uh, uh, it is pretty much a uh, general computing device in my perspective so i would not uh, put uh, a smartphone in the category of an iot but yes it is a debatable aspect you can have a, a one saying that yeah i have all kinds of sensors there i'm sensing my environment and then i'm sending the data to the internet and then i'm doing it yes you can you can use that argument but in my opinion it's not a thing right it's not a generic thing which uh, which i'm sort of embedding data with and hence i would not consider that as an iot device 
uh, Shubendra is asking a question which programming language is best suited for IoT systems de design again uh, it differs uh, if you are on the terminal node side you might use um, uh, languages like C there are uh, the intent is to sort of optimize in fact the operating systems that you use in terminal nodes itself will actually change because you want them to be very optimal systems that can run for years together on low battery so the intent will be to sort of conserve energy so the uh, the programming languages that you use need to be uh, from a perspective of reducing that cost having said that there are some use cases where people have used uh, higher uh, I mean um, uh, Languages like Python as well on the node side, but in my opinion most of the node side development happens in, uh, in in More optimal programming languages. There's no rule as such uh, typically uh, On the cloud side you typically use your standard web development uh, uh, Languages JavaScript Python all these Java so uh, you you have multiple options that are there again front end in terms of applications uh, there's no difference between an application that is developed for uh, an iot device and a normal application in terms of the programming language that needs to be used so there you use whatever you normally use kotlin flutter java uh, javascript react native all those kind of things work so it, in iot it's more about uh, the uh, ability of the architect and the uh, decision makers to choose the right tool right programming language for the right use case so based on your use case you will need to customize your architecture and that will actually define what kind of um, uh, hardware platform what kind of software platform what kind of uh, application development platform you will actually use and that is one of the key aspects there's no one size fit all in IoT uh, why is uh, okay Ravi asks why is security in IoT difficult is it cost and limited capability of components it's it's all of these put together Ravi uh, primarily because you you you're, you're not looking at one place where you you have a surface of attack uh, you uh, you need to sort of take care of security at the uh, at the hardware device in terms of the terminal node end you need to sort of make sure that the right sensor data is actually coming in and somebody is not sort of tampering with that you need to make sure that uh, the security is tight from the device through the communication protocols in which case you need to make sure that the communication protocol is is tight you need to make sure that the uh, microcontroller uh, uh, or the or the hardware device or the uh, processing platform that you are using on the terminal node is not compromised right so you need a lot of security related aspects there you need to take care of security as i said in the communication um, uh, protocol side you need to take care of security on the cloud right access to the cloud right security on the app side so security is something that spans across iot and you will need to uh, incorporate security uh, from the ground up right you can't develop an application and then say okay now i will i've developed all the functionalities now i will add security that doesn't work your architecture will need to uh, incorporate security uh, as a um, as a one in fact probably in my previous slide i missed adding uh, security that's not because security is not important security is is uh, inherently important uh, it's just that each of those people who will be working on that will be taking security as one of the requirements uh, yeah I think Raghu has a similar question how do we deal with the security of the data yeah it's again very very uh, use case specific certain use cases um, for example healthcare related use cases are very very important in terms of making sure that your security is maintained there may be certain use cases where you will say uh, okay security is not so important for example temperature data coming in or probably a bulb you may argue saying that okay uh, uh, I may not be paranoid about security because at the end of the day there's nothing that uh, comes free uh, you you can have significant high levels of security but that will come at some cost um, computational cost right uh, additional overhead cost right so security will come at cost now it is your use case that needs to decide uh, how much you are willing to pay for how much security and that is a um, is a is a challenge that the product uh, development guys or the product designers need to sort of uh, think about and articulate saying that okay this kind of a product has these kind of risks and hence this is the kind of security features that I need to have 
um, at the at the device end, at the communication end, at the cloud end, and at the application end. Hope that answers your questions. Uh, any more questions, Akash? Uh, do we have more time, or are we done? Uh, there's a question by Prema. Is it the chip programming of API or API based programming? You need both uh, on the terminal node side. You will have uh, programming on the chip on the SOC what we call as the system on chip. Uh, so you will have firmware development embedded systems development that is happening on the chip. Uh, on the cloud you will typically expose your functionality as as APIs application programmer interfaces for your applications to uh, to consume the apis all right so you will need both uh, for an entire iot solution you will need both chip programming as well as api based programming uh pile says so if i understand correctly iot is more of a concept which is achieved with the help of multiple techniques as mentioned such as cloud computing data analytics visualization is data science a part of it yes of course pile bang on you you've got it right iot is in fact uh, more than a concept i would rather say it's a paradigm uh, it's a paradigm shift it's the way you actually start thinking about it so it was it earlier just like it was not one technology it was it was a set of technologies coming together now you have iot where uh, iot is more about how we think about the world around us right and we include not only uh, people interacting with machines you have now uh, everyday things interacting with uh, the digital world yes data science is also uh, part of it uh, uh, I mean, uh, IoT generates the data for data science to analyze. Yeah, Akash says uh, we are out of time. Uh, thanks a lot for being a wonderful audience. I hope uh, the session was useful uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, a significant number of people within this group uh, will uh, will participate in the in the IoT space in the next few years. Thanks a lot everyone.